together in the second chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read a few verses here, make our prayer, and then we will look at what the Bible has to say about understanding, understanding the grace of God, understanding the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, in our Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2, and let's begin our reading this morning in verse number 7, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 7. We'll notice what the scriptures have to say here. The Bible says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's pray together if we could this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We're grateful for the opportunity that uh, you've given to us uh, to be able to gather together this morning and to worship your name Lord, we're grateful for your word and the light that we have in our hands to be able uh, to be guided in this world of darkness. And Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to better understand your wonderful, magnificent grace that you've bestowed upon our lives. Lord, I pray that as we leave here this morning that we would leave encouraged, knowing that your grace is amazing, that it is abundant. And Lord, that we would not take that grace for granted, but that we would serve you and love you with all of our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray that your word would fall on good ground, that it would grow in our hearts and in our lives. I pray, Lord, also that you would hide me behind your cross. I pray that you would give me the words to say. Lord, I, I understand I'm not able uh, to be able to help anyone. It's your word that is... Uh, the power and I pray Lord you would use your word by your spirit this morning to be a help to us so Lord we love you we thank you for all that you've done we pray these things in Jesus name amen as Christians God wants to change our lives he wants to make our life better fuller it's the abundant life that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 10 in verse number 10 God's work begins, of course, in our heart, and then it reveals itself on the outside as God is constantly at work in our life. It was Charles Schwartz's cartoon, Peanuts, where Lucy is seen saying that she wants to change the world, that, that if she was in charge, she would change everything. And Charlie says, well, that wouldn't be an easy task. Where would you start? And Lucy said, I would start with you, Charlie Brown. I will start with you. <laughs> and the reality is, is that God wants to start with us this morning. Now, a major attribute of God's change in our life is by his grace. The Bible says in this passage of scripture that we are indeed his workmanship. God is busy working in our lives. He, he wants to change us for his glory and for our good. Now Paul was no stranger to the grace of God. It was God's grace that of course incredibly saved him and took him from a life of a murderer to a missionary. And God changed his life from the inside and it was revealed in the outside. And God's grace indeed was abundant in Paul's life. We notice what Paul told the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul said, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. And God's work in our life is that our will would be lost in the will of God. And that our desire would be to follow the Lord with our life. And I believe with all my heart today that God, if you're a child of God here this morning, God is at work in your life as well. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. But what is grace? How do we define grace? Well, grace by its nature flows downward. 
Grace is God acting in favor toward those that deserve his wrath. I'll read that again. Grace is God acting in favor toward those who deserve his wrath. Grace flows from God in his attitude toward us and his actions toward us. And this truth was never more evident than when God became a man and dwelled among us. In John 1 verse 14, the Bible says, And the word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. God revealed to the world his wonderful grace in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And, and God's grace manifests through Christ in a superabundant provision of love for those who would trust in him. Now let's define mercy and grace because there's a big difference between the two and we have to understand them in order to really comprehend the message this morning. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So mercy is you not getting what you do deserve. But grace is getting what we do not deserve. And there's a major difference there. God's grace is abundant in our life. Now let's look at the grace of God this morning and notice what the scripture says. First of all, the grace of God pardons us. The grace of God pardons us. It is by the grace of God that we are spiritually set free. Now we were bound in the shackles of our own sin, but by the grace of God, we find freedom. And the Bible says that we are pardoned from sin's penalty. Look at our text here in verse 8. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We are saved by the grace of God. Now this verse simplifies salvation for us. It helps us to understand that salvation is of grace. It is not based on our works or our merits. It is a gift. It's the gift of God. We don't labor for a gift. We don't work for a gift. A gift is freely offered. Now, the Bible says that when a man believes on Christ, he is pardoned. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is a matter of undeserved favor. Now, if you have to do anything to be saved today, then it is not grace. It is not grace. Let's turn, if we could, in our Bibles to the book of Titus, if we could. The book of Titus and the third chapter, Titus chapter 3. And notice what the Bible says here in verse number 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. And let's look at what the scriptures have to say here. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now the Bible says that God has showed us mercy and God also has shown us grace. The mercy of God and the grace of God. The Bible says in this passage of scripture that we are pardoned from our sin and we enjoy the blessing of life eternal. But not only are we pardoned from our sin and from sin's penalty, but also we are prepared for service. Look what the Bible says in verse 10 here. It says in chapter two of Ephesians, verse 10, it says, for we are 
his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has ordained in salvation that we would indeed be like the Lord Jesus. And the idea here of a workmanship or workman is that we are made or created by God. Now this is not speaking of the original creation that God made, but this is speaking of a new creation, that we are indeed a new creation in Jesus Christ. God does not pardon us or set us free from our sin so that we can serve ourselves and live for ourselves. The Bible says that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved to work. And we are his workmanship to serve him. Titus chapter 3, would you turn there in our Bible and look again in verse 8. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 8 here. The Bible says this, Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Paul said to Titus, I want you to constantly tell the children of God that we are saved for a purpose and that we are saved to live for the Lord Jesus. It was Paul that told the church at Corinth. Corinth was a carnal church. And he said to the church at Corinth that the old things are passed away. Behold, the new uh, and all things have become new in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 says, For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I heard the story as I was reading a commentary this week of uh, Dr. Harry Ironside. And he told the story of an attempted assassination on the first queen of England. And this individual was caught and she was brought uh, before the queen. And the queen said to her, she says, if I show grace, will you promise or make me a promise? And the accused one replied, grace that has conditions is no grace at all. And the queen said, you are right, and I pardon you. And history states that the accused one became the queen's most faithful, most faithful servant. We are pardoned by the grace of God. We are saved by the grace of God. And the Bible teaches us that we are now to serve the Lord and, and, and walk with the Lord out of a heart of love for all that he has done for us. It is God's grace that pardons. But let's think about this if we could this morning. It is God's grace that purifies. It's God's grace that purifies. It's by God's grace indeed that we are saved, but also by God's grace that we will live for him. Whether we, are, uh, whether we got saved later in life and, and maybe lived a, a life for ourselves and, and, and God has changed us or, or maybe we grew up in a Christian home and we got saved as a child, I want us to understand it's still God's grace that keeps us living for him. It's still the grace of God that is abundant in our life and it is God's grace that purifies our motives I, I want you to notice with me here to uh, look at Romans chapter 5 if we could Romans chapter 5 in our Bibles and notice what the scriptures teach us here in verse 21 Romans chapter 5 and verse number 21 and notice what the Bible says here God's grace purifies our motives Romans 5 verse 21 the Bible says that as sin hath reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let's notice if we could what Paul said in Romans chapter 6 
and verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now notice the response here. The Bible says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, a, a real understanding of the grace of God frees us from sinful motives. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. When God in grace deals with a, a Christian, the Bible says that he produces truth in him. Howbeit, John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit guides us into the truth. He leads us away from our sin and unto the Lord. You know, someone said this when they were talking about becoming a Christian and their old life. They said, when I got saved, I stopped running to sin and I started running from sin. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't sin because we are sinners by nature and choice. But the reality is we have a different motive in our heart. We have a different purpose in, in our life. And God has given to us a new song. It is the grace of God that purifies our motives, but also it is the grace of God that purifies our ministry. Back to Titus in the second chapter, verse 14. The Bible says this, who gave himself for us, speaking of the Lord Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Peculiar there means that we are an owned people. We belong to God. It doesn't mean you're weird. Well, for some of you. <laughs> it means you're owned by God. And the Bible says that we are, we belong to God and we ought to be zealous of good works to serve the Lord. God's grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and to live a godly life. God's grace teaches us to serve him and to love him with our heart. It is the grace of God that teaches us that we are to follow him. And those who turn God's grace into a sinful advantage against God's law are only fooling themselves. I mean, that was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the Bible in Revelation chapter 2. 2 and verse number 6 and the Bible says that Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans who used the grace of God as a license to do whatever you want but listen the grace of God is not a license to live any way you want the grace of God is the opportunity to do what you ought and it is God's grace that is abundant in our life and in the context of God's grace the Bible says it purifies our motives, it purifies our ministry as we desire to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me look thirdly, if I could, the grace of God preserves. It is the grace of God that preserves. God's grace creates a, an inner peace within our hearts in difficult times in difficult situations. And I've experienced that grace of God in my own life, and I've seen that grace of God abundant in the life of others, where you wonder, how do they get the strength to do that? How, how can they do that? It is the grace of God that is evident in their life. And the Bible teaches us that we are indeed preserved through pain. Can you turn with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice what the scriptures say here. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7. 
Look what the Bible says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. The Bible says this of the Apostle Paul, and least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Three times Paul prayed, and I don't think it was three prayers, but three seasons of prayer, where Paul sought the face of God that this physical handicap would be removed from his life. And the Bible says in verse number 9, And he said unto me, This is the Lord. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God is not attracted to our strength. God is attracted to our weakness. And it is during those times of weakness that God, God gives grace. Now, God could have healed Paul. God could have taken this physical ailment, this physical handicap away from him. But instead of healing Paul, God gave him grace. God gave him grace. Charles Spurgeon said this, I am afraid that all of the grace that I have gotten out of my comfortable and easy times might lie on a penny. But the good that I have received of my sorrows and pains cannot be measured. Affliction is the best book in my library. Affliction. Can we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 in our Bibles this morning? 1 Peter chapter 5. And notice what the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 5. If you get to 2 Peter, you've gone too far. Just put it in reverse a little bit and you'll find it. 1 Peter chapter 5. And then look what the Bible says in verse number 10 together. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10. The Bible says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. It is the God of all grace that helps us in difficult time. The strength of God is given to us in times of distress, in times of pain, in times of sorrow, in times of heartache, times in our life where we don't understand, that we seek for answers, but we cannot find answers. It is at those times, those difficult times, those hard times that God's grace is seen in our life. And it's God's grace that shows up just on time like a child waiting for a ticket to go on the train from their dad, and their dad gives them that ticket just on time to board that train. God's grace is similar. God gives us the grace that we need for the problems we face today. God doesn't give grace for imaginary problems. That's why we struggle with worry so much, because we struggle with worry of problems that don't even exist God doesn't give grace for imaginary problems. He gives his grace for where we are today and the struggles that we face today and the difficulties of our life today. Booth Tucker preached in Chicago one day and out of the, the, the great multitude of people, um, a, a man came from the audience and he was burdened. You, you could tell by his face that this man was burdened. And he said to Booth Tucker, he says, you can talk like you uh, that about how Jesus Christ is so dear to you and how he helps you. But if your wife was dead, as my wife is, and you had some babies crying for their mother, you would never come back. Uh, you would never come back. Uh, you could not say what you are saying in this message today. 
A little later, Booth Tucker lost his noble wife in a railway wreck, and the body was brought to Chicago and carried to the Salvation Army barracks for the funeral service. After others had conducted the funeral service, he stood there by the casket, looked down into the face of his silent wife and mother, and said, The other day when I was here, a man said, I could not say, Christ was sufficient if my wife was dead and my children were crying for their mother. If that man is here, tell him that Christ is sufficient. My heart is all broken. My heart is all crushed. My heart is all bleeding, but there is a song in my heart, and Christ has put it there. And if that man is here, tell him that. Though my wife is gone and my children are motherless, Christ comforts me today. And the man was there. And down the aisle he came and fell down beside the casket and said, Verily, if Christ can help us like that, then I will surrender my life to him. I will surrender my life to him. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. He added affliction. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplying trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun because his love has no limit. His grace knows no measure. His power no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches is Jesus. He giveth and giveth. And giveth again. God knows the way of the righteous, even though it be dark and drear. He knows when we're tired and weary, our burdens too heavy to bear. We ask as the shadows lengthen, Lord, lift thou this burden of care. And often his voice rep replieth, My child, I placed it there with grace that is all sufficient, that you might grow stronger in me. So trust, weary child, your father. He knoweth and careth for thee. It is God's grace that helps us. God's grace is preserved through pain. But also, I want us to think about this. We are preserved through prayer. Can we turn, if we could, to the book of Hebrews and the fourth chapter, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And notice what the Bible says in verse 16. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and verse 16. The Bible says this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And perhaps this morning you're burdened I encourage you today to seek the grace of God at the throne of God. A man can no more take a supply of grace for the future than he can eat enough today to last him for the next six months, to take sufficient air into his lungs to sustain life for a week to come. He must draw upon God's boundless stores for grace from day to day. As we need it, D.L. Moody says, God supplies it. We all need God's grace today. There's not a person here this morning that does not need God's grace. And because grace flows downward, we can all receive that grace. Some need grace to pardon. Some here need grace to purify. And others need grace to preserve. But wherever you are this morning, may you come to the throne of grace and find God's grace in the time of your need. Because it's amazing and it's abundant and God's grace will see you through. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done. We're grateful for 